It's time to get sexy, so watch Secular Sexuality Live Thursdays at 7 p.m. Central. Visit tiny.cc slash YTSS and call into the show at 512-991-9242 or connect to the show online at tiny.cc slash call S-E-X. Welcome to another episode of Talk Heathen, everybody. Uh, my name is Kenneth. I'm going to be hosting for you today. And with me is a man for whom I've run out of adjectives. There's just good ones. Good good adjectives, Lloyd. Um, Thank you. Lloyd Evans, how the heck are wow, you? Wow, what a, what a generous introduction. I'm, <laughs> I'm not used to that sort of thing. Usually it's, uh, and here's Lloyd. You know. Oh, no. I, Sorry, we, we couldn't find anyone else. It was all very last minute, you know, I, so... I was over here. I was, you know, during the intro, I'm sort of racking my brain going, you know, the, you know, the, the brilliant Lloyd Evans, the sexy Lloyd Evans. I mean, it all, it all applies. I just didn't want to narrow it down to one or two specific. If you're characters. looking for me to co-host so, again, you don't need to keep trying. I'm, you know, you've <laughs> succeeded. So, well, um, Lloyd, what do you say? We just dive into a call here. Let, the, let's, let's the plummet into the a call. All a boot. So here we go. Uh, we've got Ophir. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, in Israel, uh, saying that you are a nihilist and you want to to talk about that. Um, Ophir, what can we do for you? Hello. <laughs> How's it going? Uh, good. How are you? I, good. I I got to tell you, my my immediate response to seeing that you're a nihilist is is going like like what's the point of even calling man i mean isn't it all sort of meaningless <laughs> um <laughs> I, you know to be honest I, I i thought about it you know i yeah. thought yeah I, everything is pointless so calling might be um you know pointless <laughs> well uh, we're here so you know let's uh let's talk let's talk about it what uh what specifically about nihilism? What was it that you wanted to talk to us about? Like, what do atheists think about nihilism in, in like a way that um, you can you can describe? Like, what do you think about nihilism? And like, I fit the description of it, like rejection, rejection, and stuff. Uh, what do you think about it? Well. Let's maybe put down some, do some groundwork here before we just dive right in. So um, for there, there may be people listening who don't know what nihilism is, um, or when they hear nihilist, they just think of like the big Lebowski or something, you know? So when, when we're talking about nihilism, what exactly is it that you, that you mean when you, when you're referring to yourself, what does nihilism entail um, when, when you're talking to people? Um, the reject, I mean, the, the the consensus is that basically nihilism is the rejection of all moral and religious and moral principles and uh that the belief that life is meaningless this is the main like the main course hmm. the main uh, definition of okay. nihilism okay. see i'm glad i asked but, because i was i was going to essentially that life has no meaning um so I'm glad that we got your, yeah. your definition. Okay. Um, so you're asking us what we think about, about that, the, the rejection of principles? Uh, Help me out. Uh, okay. Like, what do you think about, like, instead of, instead of thinking about, like, the God question, I reject the God question? Like, you know, like, if, if someone says, Oh, I I believe in God. I don't believe in God. I say I don't believe in the question. Yeah, right, right. I don't. I'm like disbelieving in the in the idea of uh, religion. 
you when know? you say yeah. that life is meaningless, what do you think, what kind of meaning could life have that would make it meaningful? Um, I don't know, to be honest. I mean, you can say that, well, life doesn't have inherent meaning, but you can, you can give it your own meaning, right? Uh, like uh, waking up in the morning and seeing the star and seeing the the sun is gives me meaning gives meaning to my life. Like you know, basic stuff. And and what's the problem with that? But, um, what's the problem with inherent meaning? With subjective meaning. Oh, subjective meaning. Hmm. Uh, I don't have a problem with subjective meaning. It's just that uh, depends on the I, depends on the, they're all types of nihilism. There's positive nihilism. There's uh, uh, what um, epistemology epistemology ah epistemology. Words are tough. No, I get it. I I get that there are different flavors of nihilism. I uh, the thing. Yeah, yeah. That, I, that I was thinking about over here was like, you know, because when you talk about rejecting the the question with respect to religion, that that was interesting to me because I, I found myself sort of putting on my 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 Jesus hat, reverting back to how I thought when I was a, a, a Christian and thinking about how I would have said that my meaning uh, was sort of given to me from on high, that, that God decides what the meaning of of all of our lives is. Um I don't mm -hmm. feel that way anymore. Um, and what, what, I, what I found myself thinking was that even, even if there were um, a God who told me what the meaning of my life was supposed to be, say, you know, scripture was a legit thing and there was some sort of revealed word of God and God was like, your meaning is to do X, Y, and Z. Um, I, I, I would still be able to decide whether or not I agreed with that. Um, even if there was some sort of, you know, for lack of a better term, like intrinsic meaning or some like imposed meaning coming from a God. There's nothing that says I got to cooperate with that. I might find meaning in something entirely different. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that no matter how you slice the, the question of religion, I don't think it gets us any closer to something like objective meaning or intrinsic meaning. I, I, I think that when I think about this stuff in terms of like meaning and purpose in our lives, uh, it strikes me as I don't know how we get away from subjective meaning. Um, depends. I am an absurdist, which means I found the the whole concept of life absurd because we we live and then we die, we live and then we die. So mm -hmm. we we wake up in the morning and we're like, okay, I'm alive, but mm -hmm. what? what else you know there's nothing like you can't you can't find in, in, like subjective meaning in everything right like in the, the sun the moon the, the the beautiful mornings but inherently there's nothing really um really logical going on like i guess imagine yeah. Um, like if you, if you say, oh, well, logic, I, I, I'm a skeptic. Well, I'm an analyst, which means I, I don't, I don't think that the question itself, um, is like absurd, you know, that have the, you ever, everything is absurd. Have you, ever, have you ever had like a really good or a really bad meal? Um... Let's focus on I good. Have, have, have you ever had a really, really good meal in your life? I had a cheeseburger with fries and, and stuff. Well, I just mean a meal that you enjoy. So, I mean, I, I think most of us, it, it, hopefully at one point or another in our lives have had like a really good meal. And the fact that that, that period of time during which we were enjoying that meal is finite, um, you know, that doesn't in any way diminish our experience of being present and having that, that meal. Um, I, I wonder if, you know, 
because I, I hear people say something like, and this is not precisely what I, I heard you say just now. So I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but I think there may be some, some related concepts going on here. I hear people say stuff like, well, what's the point of life? It's just going to, as an atheist, you know, cause it's just going to end someday anyway. And, you know, I, I guess I, I, I find myself looking at life being kind of like, like I'm sitting down and enjoying a meal, right? Just because one day that meal is just going to, you know, be shit doesn't make it any less of an experience while I'm having it, right? Any more than the fact that one day I'm going to be worm food makes my life any less of an experience that I'm having. Um, so finding the meaning in this life, I mean, it's an ongoing project. Um, I, I don't, I don't see, maybe I'm just not following you fully, but I don't see where, you know, like the finite nature of life um, would make it less meaningful or would necessarily render it absurd. Um, imagine you have, um, imagine you, like, the, the, like, are you, are you familiar with the, the, the floating teapot around Mars? The like, Russell's like, teapot. Like, the Russell's teapot, exactly. Like, sure. if you take this idea and you and you put it in an absurd fashion, you can say, "Well, I don't. Not only I don't think there is a pot, teapot, a Russell's teapot. I reject the question. Like, there is no. Um, there's nothing to. Uh, how do you say it? nothing to communicate. There's nothing to, uh, there is no knowledge in the first place to, 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 to understand what there is and what there is not. I don't see what that has to do with um, what I was just saying. So the, the, the reason why I'm kind of pushing back is, is because, and trying to talk about where we can find meaning is because I, I frequently hear believers saying that atheism necessarily leads to some sort of nihilism that it's not possible for us to have purpose in our life. And I, I, I don't like it when they do that because I, I have lots of purpose in my life. I have lo I, there's lots of meaning in my life to me, my, you know, what I find valuable might not be what someone else finds valuable. The people I care about, other people might not care about, but to me, I, you know, I'm having this set of experiences. So there, there, there is some meaning here to be, to be found. Um, so when we're talking about questions related to what people believe and the experiences that people have, um, you know, people there, 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 there's something there uh, from my perspective. Um, Lloyd's got a set of experiences. I have a set of experiences. You have a set of experiences, and all of us, you know, subjectively, by virtue of us having the capacity to be feeling things and to be interacting with the world around us, um, I think where we find meaning. Um, is important. And the fact that it's possible to find meaning is, is important, even in a, a finite life in a universe that's indifferent to us. Well, I, I mean, well said, well said. Um, I can see why people think that nihilism is extreme because it, it's, it's like extreme skepticism mm -hmm. uh, because it says that nothing can be communicated or not known. Um, but also, um, my, my question is like, people say, well, it's not being about being realistic. It's about, uh, like rejection and, uh, wow. I, my brain is melting right now. I don't know what to say. It happens. Sorry. I, I guess my only yeah. issue, well, uh, first of all, I'm not really interested in persuading nihilists not to be nihilists. My beef is with with religion and the whole God project, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, but I, I do the thing that I I'm not persuaded on is when you talk about inerrant meaning being almost the be all and end all. So I asked at the beginning about subjective meaning, um, and it seems that subjective meaning isn't enough for you there needs to be an inerrant meaning and i guess i'm just perplexed as to why that would be so why does there need to be some overarching meaning that affects everybody why can't we derive the meaning that we individually derive from life i can understand 
why if your life really, really sucks and you're in a really, really dark place, and this is where we're straying into mental health and neither Kenneth nor I are mental health professionals, but I can understand why nihilism would become more of a pressing issue if things are going very, very badly wrong in your life. But I think that's more a case of um, identifying where things have gone wrong and trying to recalibrate your life so that it's working. Uh, But in terms of life in and of itself and whether it has meaning or not, I think it's self-evident that people can derive meaning on an individual basis and don't need to have meaning dictated to them by the supernatural or a religion or whatever. Um, Look, pardon my English, but I'm really trying here. Um, I think you're doing great. I'm trying to... Yeah. Uh, Maybe it's because I'm looking at the... No, you're muted, but I'm looking at the comments and I'm shaking. Oh, forget the comments. Forget the comments. Just talk to us. Those those people don't even exist. And if they did, it'd be meaningless, right? right? So, right, you're right, man. That's exactly it. <laughs> just, I'm, look, commenters, I'm just uh, kidding. I'm, I'm just fucking. I, we love you. Okay, be nice for God's sake, Jesus. Um, look, I we're, we we do have a couple other calls. It looks like popping up in the queue, but let's. Uh, I, I just want to talk for very very briefly because I'm like a, a white belt when it comes to philosophy, but I I like the idea, per, and this is just. A personal thing, I guess, um, of nihilism being sort of a gateway to more meaningful and a more meaningful exploration of how human beings can determine what is and is not meaningful. Um, if there's no externally imposed purpose or meaning, if the universe is indifferent to us, but we're still here sharing this planet, um, to me, it's it's just a, a really fascinating and beautiful project for us to figure out how to make the most of that um so i yeah i I sort of apologize for not being able to engage with you more on the on on nihilism um but i uh i i wonder if it can be a gateway to something that might be a little bit more fun frankly uh maybe positive nihilism i don't know i don't know Um, man that's like saying, well, life is meaningless, so I can make my own meaning. Um, that's positive nihilism, you know, not sure. Yeah. Um, you can say, well, if life doesn't have a meaning, you can say that, well, you can do your, you do, you do your own stuff. You can do your own, your own shit. Yeah. Your own, uh, you know. You certainly can. Like. Afir, I, I appreciate the call very much. We, we got to move on because we, we're starting to get stacked up in the queue here. Um, but, you know, have a great week. I hope you have a meaningful week, frankly. Um, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, take care, man. Um, all right. Before we transition into another call, let's let's knock out some some announcements. All right. I think for we those... should. I, I've been waiting for you to do that, to be honest. <laughs> Thank you. For those who might not be aware, I and I hope we've got some first timers here in the uh, in the in the live chat, people who are watching, people who are listening. Uh, So Talk Heathen is a product of the Atheist Community of Austin, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that's all about the promotion of positive atheism and the separation of religion and government. And if you are are liking what you're seeing um, or what you're hearing, you can support Talk Heathen and the ACA by becoming a member. Uh, Below the video, you'll see a, a join button click that, become a member if you'd like. Uh, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash talk heathen to me. Uh, we also have a channel that houses all of the ACA shows in strictly podcast form. If you'd like to just let Lloyd's baritone just wash over you like a soothing breeze. I don't know. Uh, but that's it. Uh, tiny.cc slash AEN podcast. You need to pay for that sort of thing. Anyway. <laughs> 
<laughs> the soothing the soothing sounds of uh, i'll try that's to i'll whole, try to that's a whole different service that's not connected with what i do with the aca anyway, that's true i'll that's try true. to i'll try to ease up on my my screeching raspy nonsense to make the podcast experience more enjoyable for all you guys um you can become a part of the talk even community also in our fan run facebook page uh if you go on facebook.com slash groups slash talk heathen fg uh, you'll find a whole bunch of of nice folks on there. Um, I, I'm always recommending to people to go uh, to go get plugged into the community here. I like seeing us all kind of coming together and and hanging out. Um, speaking of that, if you want to continue hanging out after this show, you can join us over in ACD, which is our fan run Discord server. That's at tiny.cc slash ACA Discord. I'm gonna be hanging out over there. So, Lloyd, are you doing the after show today? I can't today, no, but I, okay. I really enjoy those uh, okay. Discord sessions. Well, we yeah. can all hang out and commiserate about missing Lloyd at the uh, in the Discord. Um, and then after this show, make sure to check out the newest version of the ACA show. Some would say the flagship production of the ACA, The Nonprofits, which will air live at 3 p.m. Central today. That's at youtube.com slash The Nonprofits ACA. And with all of that out of the way, I'm amazed that you can just say all that off the top of your head Let, without well, any script or prompt. Or there's, there's I really a, struggle to be honest, but you, you've got it all down. You've there's, remembered. There's, you've remembered there's, it all. there's notes. There's an outline. This is I, I. I will not mislead or lie to our viewers and act like I'm on the ball with that. So yeah, there's a whole. You listen, people. You wouldn't believe the support group that goes into getting, you know, Lloyd and I up here upright in front of functioning equipment talking to you guys. So matter of fact, that crew, can we just really quickly, I know this isn't like the allotted time for that sort of thing. They are fine specimens. Can aren't we, they? Can we I show like some to, love to the crew and get the crew cam so people like can see, see the, yeah. the lovely individuals? Look at these Look guys. at them. God. And there's even an empty cat bed. Yeah, okay, well, we'll see if crew, cat, <laughs> if crew cat makes an appearance later. What the hell? Who's running the show if crew cat's not around? All right. Well, in the meantime, let's move on. Let's go all the way down to Melbourne in oh. Australia. To talk to A. A. Ron or Aaron, um, who wants to talk about <laughs> what is it? This is what it says. What is it that actually converts people to atheism? That's an interesting question. Um, Aaron, A. A. Ron, how's it going? Good, good, Lloyd and Kenneth. How are you both? Good. What, what can we do for you? Uh, well, uh, we we're having a discussion actually in the ACD earlier uh, this evening or this morning, depending on your uh, timestamp, uh, about what is it that actually changes a person's viewpoint. Uh, it was pretty broad, uh, but we were specifically talking about beliefs, and uh, I myself was a Christian for very large portion of my life, probably like 20 something years from birth, I uh, was a Christian. And uh, I know that uh, Lloyd converted from a, from a religious faith. And I'm not sure about you, Kenneth. Uh, I, was, I was an evangelical Christian uh, for the majority of my life. Nice, nice, nice. Okay. So, uh, I mean, my perspective was that there wasn't one particular argument. There wasn't one particular fact or anything that changed my viewpoint, but that it took time and it took people challenging me. And it also took me taking pause to, to change my view. But I, I was just interested, is there anything that you guys think is like a smackdown or a number one thing that particularly changed your viewpoint? Lloyd, do you have anything uh, that comes to mind? I, I think that it's a journey that you have to go on yourself, and everyone is at a different place in their in their journey. Uh, I often get asked with the work that I do, that's kind of focusing on Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, how do you wake up someone from a cult? How do you wake up a Jehovah's Witness to the fact that they're being lied to and exploited? And the simple truth is that if there were a way to do such a thing, if there were like a magic bullet, cults wouldn't exist, would they? Because we would be waking people up left, right and center, and there would be no basis for cults to flourish because everyone would be leaving or there wouldn't be enough people staying. So I just think that when it comes to your personal beliefs, 
there's such a thing as cognitive dissonance and we all have it and it's a survival trait if we were able to just change our minds the moment someone comes along and says hey you're wrong then our sense of self would be so brittle that we wouldn't really have one we wouldn't have a sense of self to survive for so cognitive dissonance is is in a way crucial we all have it and it it's a, a very useful tool for people for religious communities and religious leaders because they know that nobody likes to lose cherished beliefs and change their minds but mm. when you on your question I, I guess i just recoil a little bit when you use the word converting to atheism i don't use the word converting i use the word reverting because converting implies that i was born a believer in god <laughs> and obviously i wasn't i was born as a human being and from a very early age I was indoctrinated with a specific set of religious beliefs that differ hugely from other religious beliefs that other children get indoctrinated with. I reverted when I became an atheist to atheism, which is to say when I was born, I didn't have beliefs. I had beliefs when I was a Jehovah's Witness. And when I woke up to the fact that I was in a cult, I went back to having no beliefs. That's the way I look at it. Hmm. Was yeah, very profound. Like, uh, <laughs> no, 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 that's cool. I, I yeah. was brought up like a Pentecostal type of Christian, um, a Holy Spirit loving God uh, type thing. And initially I was brought up in my family church and I did have an instance where I was like, well, if this is real for me or if this is real a real thing, I should be able to move to a new church that I choose and I should be able to discover the Holy Spirit and Jesus and those types of things. And so I went along with a friend that I met at school and we went, to, I became a member of that church and I became a youth, youth sort of, sort of a youth leader. I, I suppose I didn't get any formal training or anything like that. Um, but I went ahead and did that. And it wasn't until a number of years later where certain questions weren't being answered or anything like that, that I, I even began to consider the fact that God didn't exist or that there were other arguments to be had. And uh, it was often the conversation that shows like this or shows like the atheist experience, et cetera, are too hard on the, on the arguments or, or too, uh, yeah, I mean, shut people down and those types of things. But for me, like there was a time where I was prepared to hear the arguments come forward and then hear the rebuttals. That's that's the and thing. then think yeah. about them, you know. So yeah, I, and I I agree with everything that that Lloyd said. Um, as as you were speaking, uh, I was thinking about a couple of things that I want to share with you. So one is goals. So the 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 call screen thing like i said it says you know what is it that converts people to atheism was was the the question on the table um i want to i want to say very clearly i don't think it should be anyone's goal to convert anybody to atheism or to revert people to atheism i don't think convincing people of atheism should be should be anyone's goal um i think all of us our goal should be to follow the evidence to where it leads to be responsible uh, epistemically, you know, in terms of the positions that we take. Um, if that leads to atheism, then cool. If it leads us somewhere else, cool. We should be, we should want to believe true things. Um, so it, it, it just happens to be the case that uh, the case for theism um, is pretty, pretty weak. So uh, with that in mind, what you're referring to a moment ago, when you talk about that, that openness, um, there's a term for that, and I might I might be messing this up, but I wrote all my notes. I believe it's referred to as doxastic openness. Is this idea that you are open to changing your mind when your beliefs collide with new evidence, okay? Um, or if you recognize that you don't have evidence for your beliefs, that you that you are willing to change your mind. And I think that that is the key uh, when it comes to, in in my experience, changing people's minds when it comes to what they believe. Um, 
if people are really just committed to their beliefs and they want to defend those beliefs at all costs, uh, then then you're going to have a hard time trying to, to have a conversation with them about what they believe and why. If people are open to changing their mind, uh, well, well, now we can now we can just do that thing that I was talking about earlier of just following the evidence where it leads and hopefully get on the same page. Um, and it's important to recognize this is the last thing I wrote down. Um, there are stages of change um, that when it comes to you know what people believe, what people's behaviors are. So oftentimes you run into people who are in what would be referred to as a pre-contemplative stage. They're they're not open to to new stuff. They are not interested in changing their mind. They're not even thinking about it. They've got the thing that they believe, and that's it. That's enough for them. Um, so I think that the entire project often revolves around just budging people off of that pre-contemplative stage into a state of doxastic openness, and then just having an open and honest conversation about the evidence. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I, 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 I agree with that because I mean, there were times when I was a believer that people challenged my beliefs and they presented me with evidence that I wasn't aware of or I didn't align with what I believed in. And there was not an acknowledgement even at the time. Um, it wasn't until a lot later on when I was trying to look for those answers that uh, things happened to change for me. But uh yeah, I, I I tend to be uh, of that viewpoint that, that that it is a process, and that um, there are people that are not interested at the particular time that you're talking to them. Um, and conversion is it's a loaded word, and it's typically what believers use <laughs> to define uh, their their position, where it's like I'm going to convert someone to the faith or and that sort of thing. So yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Cool. Well, I hope, I hope we were at least a little bit helpful, um, with that. Um, we're going to move on to some other, some other folks. Um, let's see here. Uh, Aaron, is there anything else that we can help you with? I don't know. I, I appreciate you both. And I think you're doing both, both doing a great job and I love hearing you both. And thank you very much. Thanks awesome. for calling in. All right. Cool. Piece of cake. Right, Lloyd? Oh, yeah, it's, it's just nice to talk these things through, isn't it? It's a really complicated thing, you know, persuading people, you know, whether it's religion or whether it's politics, whether it's tastes in music, whether it's tastes in film, we all have our concrete ideas that we settle on and become important to us and won't be easily dislodged. And religion is a particularly difficult uh, set of beliefs or can be a difficult set of beliefs to dislodge. So, yeah, uh, I personally, the way the way I say it is I don't lose any sleep over over religious people I failed to convince or failed to persuade. I think that's yeah. the difference between or one of the many differences between the atheist position and the theist position is that when you're a theist, you typically crave bringing people to your uh set of ideas whereas when you're an atheist you you don't really care you yeah. just you just want to um you're happy to have conversations or in some cases happy to have conversations but you're not necessarily interested in in dragging everyone into your set of views well there's no mandate you know we're not yeah. we're not called to go evangelize you know yeah. so it's you know that's that's a bonus take some pressure off <laughs> definitely <laughs> so, yeah <laughs> well before we move on to more calls um we got a little promo that we'd like to show you so Ooh. roll film yeah it's a generally good idea to not just go up and tug on anybody's tail under any circumstances but uh <laughs> in particular if that tail is connected to somebody's rectum you could be doing some damage. Then you're probably going to get the first bit of life. And then when those bits of life interact with other bits of life, new bits of life happen. And then suddenly you got people and the internet and JFK conspiracies and all kinds of stuff. Dude, we got to get, we got to get our TV show picked up by Netflix. Like, what do we do? What do we add? Like, let's, let's like impregnate people with parasitic eggs. Michael uh, wants to talk 
Aboot. How to talk Aboot. to theists. I'm speaking your language, right, Nate? With the Aboot, right? That's uh, yeah. Oh yeah. It's you just, betcha, it's just cultural sensitivity. I can summarize that, which is. Hey, I think you're really cool, Matt. I don't think you've had a good conversation with a really smart theist, but I'm a really smart theist, and Sam Harris agrees with this point that I made, and somebody else agrees with this point that I made. So let me point out how science actually presupposes the existence of God, and that philosophical naturalism, which I know you don't hold to, which is irrelevant to this. I mean, you just keep going and going and going. Try decaf, first of all. Nice. It's nice. an impressive power that Matt has to do that. I've, yeah. I've tried many times. Yeah, but, people uh, often go, when he goes into that extra gear... Um, <laughs> The chipmunk gear. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty impressive. Well, oh. <laughs> we, we, uh, we've got another caller here in the, in the, in the queue. Um, we're going to go to Cedif in, uh, Espana. Uh, Cedif, how the heck are you this week? I'm doing great. Thanks for yourself. Not, not too shabby. Um, hello. I, yeah. Can you hear us? Uh -oh. Yeah, not in here. Okay, good. Yeah, we're doing all right. Um, so I see here listed that what you'd like to speak about is uh, what is bodily autonomy. So I want to I want to do that with you, um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna spoiler alert. I I've noticed that uh, you in the call screen thing are labeled as a theist. So I would like to try to have a talk with you about that as well on the tail end of the bodily autonomy thing. So. Uh, yeah, what is it that you're wondering about with respect to to bodily autonomy? Yeah, cool. So um, continuing our last conversation, more or less, <laughs> which didn't go so well. Um, but I still want to talk about um, abortion. Okay, are we talking about what is bodily autonomy, or or, or about? I guess just just go ahead and, and dive in with whatever it is that you want to talk about, and we'll we'll catch up. I'm showing you're still on the line there. Have we? Uh, I'm going to give it about five seconds. See if, if, if you're there, make a, make a sound. All right. I'm going to return see to the queue and see if we can't sort, sort that out. Um, in the in the interim, I guess Lloyd, what what do you what's your take on on bodily autonomy? It sounds like he's he's more interested in talking about abortion. I gotta say, uh, I, I, I guess my... does have she her as as pronouns in the queue. So okay, wanna... it's, I do apologize. It sounds like she wants she wants to talk about abortion, and in that case, my question would be, why didn't she say abortion when she was speaking to the call screeners? Why say bodily autonomy? So that would be my question. That is that is a good uh, a good question. Let me see if mm. um, I'm not getting any feedback here about the call. We're looking like we're back. Okay, let's see. Sita, how are we doing? Hello. There we go. Hi. Sorry, okay. I got kicked out of the call. I don't know how much you heard about. Um... Of what I was saying, I just realized at the end that I was disconnected. Yeah. So okay. So just just dive back in. Lloyd had a had a question for you, real quick. Uh, if you want to hear that, um, I don't know if. You... Yeah, I was just curious yeah. as to why why not mention the abortion to the call screeners because the call screeners wrote down bodily autonomy, and it sounds like your question is really more to do with abortion. Um, no particular reason. I just want to go to um, the body autonomy argument a bit deeper. I mean, it's not the first time I'm calling. I think the scrolls, call screener and the other host knows exactly that I'm going to talk about abortion. So no particular reason, just I want to talk right. particularly about bodily autonomy because I feel that it's like the main argument for being pro-abortion. Okay. So uh, I would say bodily autonomy is a person's, um, their, their right to uh, make decisions about what they do with their body and what is done to their body. They can make their own medical decisions. Um, that there is, there is a, uh, a, a, a benefit to people having a right to make, to be sort of self-determining with respect to their, their own bodies. It's a messy definition, but I, I'm, I'm, I think that pretty much covers it. Okay. So would you say there are any, um, exceptions for, for this rule or 
this understanding of body autonomy? Yeah, absolutely. Like for example, um, okay. yeah. you know, we we put people in in jail uh, yeah. here in the United States if they're a risk to other people. There are things that you can't do with your body if you're gonna, you know, cause harm to someone else. Um, that's usually where we draw the line. Yeah. Um, is if you're gonna be doing something that's a harm to another person, um, that that's considered yeah. not okay. The, the saying goes, you know, the, your your right to swing okay. your fist ends where my nose begins. That kind of thing. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, so you guys do not consider the fetus as uh, another being at all, then? If if you say that's like the limits of bodily autonomy where the other subjective being um, experience starts is where your fist ends. Um, well, I, wouldn't the perception of some type of fetus? I think that there's, from my perspective, um, you know, and I'm, I'm only speaking yeah. for myself here. I think that when I'm looking at it, it makes sense to me that there's a point at which I think I would feel comfortable referring to a developing fetus as a being and a point where that yeah. the, the word being feels inappropriate when we're talking about, you know, a, a clump of cells, you know, a, a little, what do you call it? Like a blastocyst that I, that I don't see yeah. any reason to think of that as, as a being. And I don't know exactly where that line is drawn, yeah, but, but even if that yeah, developing page. fetus is a being, um, I don't yeah. think that an argument can be made that a person carrying a fetus um, should be compelled to carry that fetus one instant beyond when they want to. Okay. Um, even though this, um, decision and the resulting action would result in the death of the fetus? I, could, could I just ahead. interject? Yeah, definitely. I, I just think it's really, really yeah. important that, that we are transparent here as to what the conversation even is at this point, because mm -hmm. I just haven't heard okay. an argument. So I guess my question would be, what is your actual argument? Because th there's all sorts of nuances when it comes to the issue of abortion and i personally feel uneasy talking about the subject as a man when we're talking about an issue where you know that involves women and where mm -hmm. women routinely in many countries have their bodily autonomy violated by legislation so that governments tell women yeah. what they can or can't do when it comes to their bodily autonomy. And, and so generally by majority male, uh, you know, legislators. The, the whole subject feels to me like I'm massively overstepping as a man commenting on this, although I do have opinions, but it's perhaps going to be more productive for the conversation if we actually hear what your argument is, if you have an argument. Yeah. Um, so firstly, in my view, um, I don't see the issue at all as you guys as men speaking about this because this is a moral issue. Um, it's not just a personal issue between one person and their organ, right? We, I think we've established that there is a subjective being involved here. And by that merit, I don't see the gender of who's discussing it at all. Okay. Right? Maybe you guys um, disagree with me. I don't know. But okay, go on. Yeah. Um, just, yeah. just to come to, to my argument. So, my understanding of bodily autonomy, um, like you guys laid it out, like there are limits where it applies and, and where we can restrict it. And my argument is that I don't see it as right that this argument can be used to um, engage in an action that results in the death of another. Lloyd, I, I love you Maybe, because I, I you, you, yeah. <laughs> you cut through everything to, to get us to, a, uh, you know, this, where this call needs to be. Yeah. So, so that was not an argument, uh, Siddhiv. That was just a, a statement of how you feel about something. Yeah. So um, it, it, it would be, again, damn it, Lloyd. Why, why, why can't you be here all the time? The, the, like, if we can get to premises and a conclusion, how would that look coming from you? Okay. Um, I don't really know how to do that, but I'll try from just from watching you guys' show. So, um, premise one, um, it's wrong to kill uh, another being for, for without a very good justification. Premise two, abortion is engaging in killing another being without a very good justification. Conclusion, it is wrong to engage in abortion without a very good justification. This is helpful. I don't know if that makes sense for you guys. Or, so, I've got... Uh, 
P1, wrong to kill being without justification. Is that fair? Prem your first premise yeah. would be it is wrong to kill a being without justification. Premise two would be abortion without, justification. without sufficient or yeah, we can, we can that, that's a good, good yeah. question. Okay, without sufficient justification. Yeah, justification. Premise two, abortion yeah. is killing a being without sufficient justification. Mm -hmm. Therefore, conclusion, abortion yeah. is wrong. Well, listen, that 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 argument, we do have premises that would lead to that conclusion. So we're halfway there. Mm -hmm. So now the question is, do these premises hold up to, you know, to scrutiny? Um, yeah. OK. I, I also I want to this is an interesting thing because this is this is this can this can be a useful call. This is going to be your best call yet. Cedar. So. When we were using we're using heavily loaded words, um, we've got wrong, we've got kill, mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. sufficient justification. Yeah. These are big ideas that would need to be unpacked a little bit. Um, so, mm -hmm. killing a being, I don't think of the vast majority of abortions as killing a being. I think of them as terminating a pregnancy. Um, and my understanding is that when we're talking about late term abortions, uh, generally speaking, those, those are, are done out of some sort of medical necessity. It, it's, it's, it's pretty rare for those to be yeah. done otherwise, but even if somebody, yeah. you know, late, late in their terms, like, you know what, I, I just, I don't want to deliver this baby. I'm, I'm done. I, I can't do this. Um, yeah. I'm wondering if maybe. Even if we granted killing a being, if we were to zero in on sufficient justification, if that could be, if that might be yeah. where, where things are useful. Yeah. I don't know. Lloyd, do you have thoughts here? Okay. I do. I do have thoughts. Course, yeah. Well, my thoughts are that uh, I disagree and I, I don't think I'm okay. going to persuade you. It's obviously something that you feel very strongly about, uh, but I found it interesting at the beginning of the call you talked about uh, pro-abortion, those who are pro-abortion. Yep. Well, I am yep. pro-choice, but that doesn't mean I'm necessarily pro-abortion. I don't rub my hands at the thought of children not being born or babies or fetuses yep. not making it through gestation so that they can be born. I don't rub my hands at that. And I can imagine yep. when a woman goes to get an abortion, it must be, in the majority of cases, an incredibly traumatic thing for them to go through. And I can imagine Agreed. a lot of scenarios in which they go through this situation as a last resort because they're sim they simply see no other way of doing it. And so when I think of abortion, I'm not thinking about it in like a, a warm, fuzzy way, like, oh, isn't abortion brilliant? Everyone should have abortions, you know? I'm thinking of abortion as mm -hmm. something that people will surely be doing in the vast majority of cases be through desperation because they have no other option. Yeah. And when we're talking about the de when, when we're talking about the abortion debate, it's simply a case of should women be allowed to have abortions or should they not be allowed to have abortions? And when we're saying not allowed, mm -hmm. what we're really saying is should the government intervene and tell women what they can or can't do with their bodies? And that, to me, is an untenable solution. So where I moralize over all of this is to say it's easier if we just allow women the right to, dis to decide whether they will bring a baby to full term. And we moralize by saying a person is a person when they're born. Because... It's a lottery as to whether a sperm meets an egg to begin with, you know, and babies mm -hmm. can be born with defects. Yeah. Children can die. Nine million children die every year before they reach the age of five. You know, the whole I this whole idea yeah. of life. And I noticed lots of people who speak out against abortion. They're interested in bringing yeah. children 
into the will, but not necessarily interested in, in the case of the Catholic Church and in the case of Jehovah's Witnesses with actually safeguarding those children once they're born, yeah, which it's really, really irritates yeah. me personally. Pro-birth so, is more accurate than pro-life. I, I'm not, I can't say I'm, I'm drastically interested in, in changing your mind. I just know that m in my mind, I've, I've thought about yeah. this an awful lot. And there simply is, I think the way Hitchens put it, there's no choice but pro-choice. And that's my view as well. Well, what I would just answer to that or ask to what that is, um, in, in your guys' pro-choice worldview, where is the choice of the fetus? Well, I've, you, have you just not been listening to what I've just said? Yeah, Do I have to repeat say, myself? Uh, you, if I have to repeat myself, it's no, going to be a really, really long call. I've 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 said I've said I've said that in my in my view, the way I justify it yeah. is that a person becomes a person when they're born. So you're just taking us back to oh well, doesn't the person get a choice when they're in the root in the womb, which negates what I've said. So uh, this is what I mean. I'm sure you've developed a viewpoint which it's going to be very very difficult for me to dislodge, and I'm not all that interested in dislodging it because my whole thing is yeah. religion you know and abortion although religion comes into it in many cases is really as far as i can see more of a political thing yeah um sorry if you feel like i was not listening but i'm talking to two people with um, apparently two different views so um the other host did say at some point in the pregnancy they do consider um that the fetus should have moral consideration as far as i understood so i'm not meaning to so oh, like so you're just talking to past me. Point. Okay, that's good to know. I completely yeah. agree with, with Lloyd yet again. I just the the I think the reason I was trying to zero in on the whole sufficient justification thing was because we, we I tried in a previous call to 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 have the discussion about what it means for something to be moral. And it didn't yeah. go well. Um so I'm yeah. trying to see, because I, the way that I'm looking at this, again, we, we, completely in agreement with Lloyd, but trying to just have the conversation with you to see, you know, what what we can do here. Even if we were to grant that a developing fetus is a being that deserves full moral consideration, when I think about sufficient justification it, through the the lens of, of of a discussion about bodily autonomy, okay. I don't think we need any more justification than the person carrying the baby wants out. I mean, there's all kinds of, of situations in our, you know, in, in society where we recognize that, that terminating a being is necessary or even a good, um, where, where those justifications can, can happen. Right. Um, so the question of what is the justification needed here to overcome any potential, you know, wrongness, which again, it, it, I mean, it's, it, it, I, I, this conversation is a mess out of the gate because like we're smuggling in this idea of, I, to be of honest, wrong. I don't know what, I don't know what it has to do with religion. I signed up for a, a I That's signed true. up for a show where we talk about God or the non-existence of God. And I'm, I'm struggling to understand where this fits in. It's That's just, true. It's not. It's not, not my job to, to to even talk about this. To be, I'll honest. tell you what, Cedar. What what deity do you believe in? Because you are listed as a theist as a theist in the in the call screening thing. So what 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 god or gods do you believe in? So I used to be Christian until um, yeah, I've been watching you guys, not specifically you guys, but like um, because experience and so on since ten years. Prior to that, I was um, Christian. Um, but post that, um, I just believe in some creator, but not affiliated to any religion. Okay. So, yeah. so why? Maybe, maybe there's a, an opportunity for a successful conversation here. What, you know, why do you believe that there's some sort yeah. of, of deity? Yeah. So you guys um, disagree with my, um, argument with the premises and so on. Yeah. Absolutely, very strongly yeah, it's, and vehemently. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a mess. And um, in, in the interest of trying to have a productive conversation, maybe we can fixate on potentially a much easier question, you know, to discuss, which would be why Why do you believe in a... Uh, 
a guy. To, and, let, and let me just spell out why I disagree with it. It's because your argument is presuppositional. Presuppositional arguments are the worst, quite frankly. So you presuppose that um, a fetus that hasn't been born yet should have the same rights as people who have been born. And I, I reject that premise entirely. And you can moralize all you like about how they should have the same rights, but objectively they simply don't. If we're talking from on a human rights basis, so that's that's why I reject yeah, your I argument, and it also right. doesn't have anything really to do with religion. Although there are many religions who are uh, anti-abortion, and I have to drive past a hospital uh, on an almost daily basis here in Sisak in Croatia, which is a very Catholic country, where there are Catholics stood outside the maternity ward with yeah. signs trying to traumatize women who are in an incredibly desperate situation going through an unthinkable dilemma and these catholics think in this particular locality at least think it's the christian thing to do to exacerbate their trauma and make things even more stressful and difficult for them that's their version of christ-like love so I do feel quite strongly on it. It's just that it has absolutely nothing to do with religion. And I signed up to talk about religion on this show. Yeah. And I'm, I'm actually about to go through the same thing. I'm, I'm moving to a much more conservative part of the United States in, in a week. And uh, when I was out there doing some home shopping recently, I, I yeah, there was people out with signs outside of clinics and things and yeah. harassing women who are, you know, trying to get some basic healthcare stuff done. Yeah. Um, so... What's interesting is that all, oftentimes in the United States, um, the, the the types of views that you're, you know, advocating for with respect to um, to abortion um, do stem from some sort of religious ideology, super patriarchal religious ideology, yeah. typically. Um, so, yeah, let's 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 walk it back. Let's talk about your God belief. And maybe maybe that can open the door to some sort of more productive thing going on here. So. Um, yeah. Okay. Why? Why do you believe there's a, a God? Um, because I cannot explain reality. Um, it's an irrational belief. I cannot prove it, but um, just um, the experience of having a subjective experience for me, um, I can really not understand it, that the universe would just create this for no particular reason, or not necessarily particular reason, but yeah, just create this way there was no necessity for it in my view um mm. that, that's why but i cannot provide you any evidence i don't expect anybody to believe it from these arguments um, i'm not basing my my views on abortion on anything to do with what a deity is saying sure well, let's just table the abortion thing for now so it, i mean i listen it, it is unusual uh, on these types of call-in shows for people to openly admit that they hold an irrational position, which is what it sounded to me like you just did. Um, I, I could have sworn I heard you say that nobody has any reason to to follow the line of reasoning that you're using for your, your God belief to the same conclusion. Um, yeah. If that's the case, why why would you hold such a position? Um, as I said, just for the mere reason that we have consciousness in this reality mm -hmm. and um, there is no way that I, it makes sense to me that um, a universe would create something like this where there is no necessity for it because plants can live and, and thrive if you're talking about living matter without needing any consciousness or subjective experience. Um, and just the fact that we do have the molecules and atoms and stuff like this in this universe to even create something like that is for me incredible. And yeah, it's just, yeah, just so out of lack of understanding basically. It, is it really that simple that, that that it just boils down to sort of personal incredulity? I guess so. You don't, and you don't, you don't have a problem with I that. Think. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, and you you don't have a problem with that. I mean, I think that when I'm talking to people who who use these types of of you know arguments or base their beliefs on these types of uh, you know faulty reasoning, uh, the question becomes, well, do, do you care about whether or not the things you believe are true? 
Yeah, I do. Of course, I do care about that very strongly. And that's why I say that I cannot prove it. This is basically an assumption I'm making. I'm not saying this is true. This is the fact. This is the reality we're living in. It's just me from my little brain and my little understanding of the universe saying, what the hell? Why is there um, these materials which can even make something like subjective experience where there is no necessity for that? So from that, I say, okay, there might be or should be something else. Um, but it's not based on me having observed anything and stuff like this. As I said, I did. I, wa- I was Christian um, up until a few years ago. Mm. But um, you guys, thanks to you and uh, the, the reasoning and stuff like this, I moved away from that. So I was able to change my mind, thankfully. And I thank you guys for that, um, like the whole ACA and so on. And um, But with the abortion issue, I just still kind of disagree. There was a point where I actually did think your arguments were reasonable, but at this point in time, I believe that your arguments are flawed for um, being... For presuppositional being reasons. Abortion is, okay. Yeah. Huh? Question-begging reasons. Yeah. Okay, so the, the the last question I'm going to have for you, because we, we're going to move, we've got two more callers I want to get to. Yeah. Be, um, cool. Do you think it would be more honest... And this is I'm I'm this is a loaded question. I am I'm steering you toward a conclusion. Okay. Do you think it would be more yeah. honest instead of putting a creator God into the gap in your knowledge to recognize the gap in your knowledge and go, I don't know. What what sound what do you think is the more honest thing to do as a person? You just said a moment ago you care about whether or not the things that you believe are true. Hundred percent. Um, to say, I don't know, and that is my path, that is where I'm moving towards. Um, but as you guys know, if you believe us before, it's not that easy as, hey, this does not make sense, and let me just leave it. Um, there is a lot of baggage there, tradition, culture, family, and so on. So I agree with you. My goal, or I, I see myself going to the side of becoming an atheist in the near future, I guess, if I can say it like that. Uh, because I do want to hold true beliefs, and um, this is, to some extent, an irrational belief, even though I'm still trying to rationalize it, like I explained it, with matter creating um, subjectivity and so on. But I do recognize that um, there you are right, that, yeah, um, I should probably ditch that. But I'm not I'm not yet there yet. Well, and we'll leave it leave it at that. Lloyd, do you have any any final thoughts for this call? She's not interested in my opinion because she talked past she talked past me before, and it's mutual. I'm not really interested in hers. So yeah. All right. Well, there we go. Still, I would say this has been our most successful dialogue, Cedif. So hopefully, we can trend somewhere more positive in the future. And you know, listen to Lloyd. But in the meantime, have yep. a have an excellent week. Thanks so much, guys. Enjoy. All right. Cool. Oh no, that's over. That's a shame. Well, I know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Conversations are fun, you know, trying to have them. They can be. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yeah. And, and I'm not being facetious. I think that was the most successful conversation that we've been able to have with CETA on an ACA show thus far. So I'm going to, I'm going to hope that we're trending somewhere positive. Um, anyway, speaking of positive things, we have wonderful patrons and I want to thank our, our top, top five to five and a half, maybe six patrons. We've got uh, Eric Tweet at the top of the list, followed by CJ Dennis, uh, followed by, Lloyd, would you do the honors for for number three here? Um, it's Dingleberry Jackson. That is correct. Yeah. That is correct. What, followed what, by- <laughs> isn't, there, isn't there like a, a Dingaloo somewhere? The great- Ah, oh, well, there's been some shuffling. So we've got oh, Dingleberry shuffling. Jackson at three. We've got okay. Balaam's donkey. Some say Balaam's donkey at four. Paul Lee at five. And then we we always throw in an honorary mention. And many, yeah. many weeks that, that honorary mention has been the great North American Dingaloo. But there's been some shuffling, some some new patrons. I some... want to know how many Dingaloos were slaughtered on the path to becoming the greatest of the North American Dingaloos. I can imagine a, a bloody, a long and bitter war. Yeah. Just to, to the, reach that pinnacle, yeah. The, the, what the fossil record indicates of, of lesser <laughs> dingaloos, yeah. varietals. Yeah. Lesser dingaloos along the along the line. Yeah, didn't quite make it. Well, yeah. this week's honorary <laughs> mention is Kalevi Helvetti. I hope I said that correctly. Um, 
yeah, thank you guys for your mm -hmm. ongoing support. We really appreciate you very, very much. Um, yeah, this all happens because of you. Uh, let's move. Let's move on. We've got um, we got a, a, a hmm, gosh, we got some interesting ones here. Okay, let's do a, a let's do we're gonna do a quickie a quickie with Lloyd and Kenneth and Rick. Um, I'm not sure I signed up for that either. But. <laughs> <laughs> Rick. Uh, it, it, all it says is your family is worried about the well-being of your soul. Um, so let's let's talk about this really fast. What can we do for you? All right, yeah. I, 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 well, let me uh, make a first things first. I was a Christian, you know, a, a Pentecostal uh, Christian, going to go to um, uh, Christ for the Nations uh, to be a youth minister, and until uh, mm -hmm. about I got out of the Air Force and I started questioning things. But anyway, uh, yeah, I um. Yeah, my uh, wife t uh, told me the other day that we got into a conversation about God. And um, she uh, said that one of her biggest fears is that uh, I'll burn in hell for eternity because she's convinced. She says that's a fact. Um, I wasn't going to get to a, you know, a debate with her about, you know, whether it's a fact or not. You know, it's, it's not worth it. You know, no women. She, but anyway, uh, she... Um, uh, yeah, but my, I'm sure my sister feels the same way. I told her that I was an atheist, and she was asking me what 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 what, what did it? You know, what uh, was it like a singular thing? But yeah, how how do I deal with um with people who honestly believe my soul is going to burn in hell for eternity? That that's my that's my that's my quandary. And if you want, so you can answer it, and I'll uh, get off the line for you. Well. Yeah, we'll we'll yeah we'll do that. We'll keep listening. I, I am gonna I'm, I'll disconnect you because we're gonna. This is a quickie with Lloyd and Kenneth. Um, so no problem. Thank you. That's, yeah. that's why I want to go for one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my my initial thought is 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 uh, maybe a little bit weird to some people listening. So I I often hear um, atheists, members of the secular community, talking about what a what a hateful thing it is to to tell people that they're going to burn in hell. Um, and it certainly can be, it can be this threatening thing. It can be this thing where it's like, you, you need to believe this, or Jesus is going to, you know, roast you like a fucking marshmallow. Um, but I, I can tell you oftentimes, um, I, and I've experienced this in my own family, um, someone telling you that they're, they're, they're afraid for you, um, because their, their religious beliefs have, have, have impacted what they think is going to happen to you. Right. So. I mean, it, it sounds to me like your family isn't saying you better change your mind or else. It sounds to me like your family it loves you and is 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 scared that, you know, they're, they're going to sort of lose you um, in this way and that you're going to suffer, um, which, man, it is a mess to try to unpack all that with people. Um, yeah, before we dive into how to do that, Lloyd, do you have any initial? Yeah, I think for me, it depends. What's the tone or flavor of the conversation? Yeah. If it's very uh, judgmental and if it's a one-way conversation so that they're saying you're going to burn in hell for all eternity um, and they're not interested in any kind of dialogue, they just want to essentially be abusive and uh, invalidate you as a person based on your lack of theism, um, I wouldn't really be interested in having that sort of person in my life, quite frankly. But if it was more along the lines of... I genuinely believe that due to the course you've taken in life, you're going to burn in hell. How do we fix this? Oh, well, you know, what's led you to that conclusion? If there's if there's a basis, any kind of basis for a respectful dialogue, and you can have a respectful dialogue and hold that position, then then that's fine. But I personally, I you know, maybe it's because I'm in my 40s now. I've, I'm just beyond trying to keep people in my life who are going to sneer down at me and and treat me as though I don't exist or have no right to exist just because I don't share their views. I'm just not interested in in reasoning with them. But if they want to have a conversation, I, I'd love to have that conversation with them and and talk about about what's brought them to that position and and whether it's a valid position to hold. Yeah, exactly. And 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 if you're if you're dealing with the the type of family members who who have concerns they're like, oh my God, you know, you're going to go to hell for this shit. Um, then the door may be open to having a conversation about hell from a couple different perspectives. Um, I mean, obviously you gotta, you gotta go like, well, well, why do you believe any of this stuff is true in the first place? Okay. Why, why, why should I believe that there is a hell? 
Um, I like to go from that from that perspective. But another another way to talk about it, to, if you're trying to sort of, you know, open people's minds, can be to go, well, wait a minute. Can we talk about the, like, the ethics of this whole situation of hell? Like, what a monstrous, like, awful, horrific. Immo- I mean, like, you, you'll hear Matt talk about how God is you know, like a thug. You know that there's this this like protection racket thing, like like God's a mob boss going. You know that's like a nice soul. Be a shame if something happened to it, right? You know, and you've got to you've got to submit yourself to this this deity, or you're going to be going to be punished. Um, I mean, there, there's there's definitely an opportunity to talk to believers about about that because the way that hell is is presented, um, and I don't give a shit if someone is you know believes in like a fire and brimstone type of like Satan with a little pitchfork torturing you forever, or if it's just that you're you know you're annihilated and you cease to exist or you can't be present with God or whatever. Every single version of hell is immoral. Um, it, it is, yeah, it's a nightmare, mm-hmm. um, and, there, and there's no justifying it. Um, the 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 very idea of infinite punishment for your little finite you know crimes against this this god is it, it is a mess so um if you want to be a little bit more on the aggressive side um you know you got options is what i'm trying to say so with that with that in mind we do have a theist on the line um who who wants to ask uh what what is your objection against christianity is the is the question on the table, um, I, we've got Le, Le Chef in in Canada. Yeah. Is that accurate? Exactly, Le Chef par excellence. Yeah. So, are we talking? Okay. There's there's two ways I could I can approach this. One is, um, what is my objection in the sense of why don't I believe it? Or we could go to sort of internal critiques of why Christianity is just like a mess when it comes to the things that are are preached, or why Christianity is you know. I can just quickly summarize. I can summarize my reasons in three words. Yeah. It's not true. Yeah, I don't believe it because I don't. I don't think there's any evidence in support of any of it. Um, so, so how about we do an internal critique? Because uh, I think, uh, Kenneth, I've uh, addressed you in the past. Uh, I brought you the seven day cycle proof, and you kind of panicked when I provided you this information. So, uh, I believe I demonstrated oh, uh, that. G- I'm sorry. This is a troll thing. So you, so you tell the screener that you want to talk about what is the objection to Christianity, and now you're switching to do the the seven day cycle nonsense. No, no, no. I, I'm I'm going to the internal critique because I already demonstrated Jesus. You're submitted to His will. By the you haven't demonstrated anything. Experience. You haven't demonstrated a thing. Uh, you should stop saying that because it's not true. Uh, what was my argument again? Because if you're saying it's not true, then you know my argument, and you refuted it, right? So what did you refute? No, I, I could be utterly ignorant of your argument and you would still be in the position of having not demonstrated anything. So how can you say I didn't demonstrate something if you're ignorant of what my argument is? What are what is the premise of my argument? Because it hasn't been because you- it hasn't been demonstrated definitionally. If I don't, if oh, I don't he, know your does argument. Does he really think the burden of proof is on is on us? Is he he does saying? this. So I mean, what what do you want to do here, caller? We got we got like you know 15 minutes left in the show. Let's 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 do this. Let's dive in. Okay, so how about this? I, I reestablish what my, my position is, and then we can do an internal critique because I know you guys are not going to try to address my points because my argument is infallible. So, again, <laughs> first proposition is authorship. Uh, hey, Lloyd, have you heard this guy before? <laughs> this is a new one for me. Oh, so, this guy, he, he calls so around his, the shows. His, and does this. his argument, like his God, is infallible. Yeah. Um, He's gonna, the, no, the burden no. of proof. The burden of proof is on us to disprove his God without him even saying yeah. a single word. Oh, that's he's, brilliant! I love well, it. He's gonna. He's gonna make the case oh, that. To, uh, let me, let's see how I do, Lishef. He's gonna make the case that uh, there's there's a, a, a biblical link between like God saying that all of uh, humanity would be following a seven day cycle, and now on our calendar where there's a seven day week and 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 this and that that is uh somehow proof of oh of we, the bible oh, oh so we have a seven day week there for god is that's what... that's where this is going <laughs> no no no, no. Lord, Lord, uh, uh, kenneth how about you let me do my job better okay do, do, okay do it, better do it. yeah go ahead it, it's based on two it's based on two infallible uh propositions number one the god of the hebrews makes exclusive claims to the seven day cycle pause two, stop he... stop muting you okay so one god i'm writing it down god of Hebrews makes exclusive claims to seven-day cycle. Seven-day 
cycle. We got infallible proof number one on the page. Let's hear number two. All right. And the God of the Hebrews, uh, or if you... Uh, you can put that in parentheses. You can say the Hebrews claimed our God. Just because this if you're going to go into semantics, because uh, uh, I know people are desperate these days. But the, the Hebrews claimed their God predicted the universal application of the seven day cycle as a demonstration or a signature, a sign of his authority over all nations. And uh, we can see by the, co- the law of cause and effect, the domino effect from 2000 years ago, when Jesus Christ said he is Lord of the Sabbath. So th- therefore, wherever there's a seven day cycle, there is the sphere of his influence. We can see Israel kept the uh, seven-day cycle exclusively. And from then till now, every nation is submitted to a seven-day cycle. So by that... Just, I just thought to, just to humor me, just to humor me, Le Chef, you sound incredibly proud of this argument. Oh, is yes. This, is, this know, your, is. is this your best argument for God? Or is there an the even better one? That, this is the best recipe I have on the menu. <laughs> I've been, you, you've been served with the delicious. <laughs> He's dead serious, like the delicious. Oh, that's that's. And disturbing. he usually, yeah, he usually calls himself Mister like delicious. That's like, so that's like really. Where, I don't know where Le Chef came from. He's 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 mixing it up. That's, that's I feel really really said. sorry for him. Poor poor guy. Yeah, so, so argue against it. Jesus argue with it. Give me a, give me a reputation. No, I'm just gonna laugh. I'm just gonna laugh. Okay, so because it's circular so, so, reasoning. So, so, it's circular reasoning. Oh, uh, Jude- Jude- Judeo-Christian society has adopted a seven-day week modeled on the Bible, that, that, that the religions and, and creeds that, that, fu- that founded the society to begin with. Therefore, God. It, it's circular reasoning and, and presuppositionalism. Reason you, okay, how, how is it circular reasoning when I'm telling you something is written in the book and it dictates your re- reality? That's not well, the reason. Also, not so the if book. I can just find any book and it will dictate my reality. Yeah, on what basis? Listen, no, 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 no. On what basis? On what basis is the Bible exclusively the authority for, for dictating our reality? You, you cannot, because I'm saying you cannot provide me any other evidence of any book that predicted the future with a universal implications. The day you can do that. Whoa, I'll, whoa, 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 whoa. I'll be coming atheist right now. Whoa. How does no? How I'm going to drag you back onto this, and you're going to squirm and try and get away from it <laughs> because you're a, a silly troll. But yeah. on what basis are you isolating and identifying the book as an exclu- the Bible, sorry, as an exclusive authority on reality and the future? On what basis are you making that claim? On the basis of the prediction I just provided to you, and that's it, and the fact that it, it is exclusive. Nobody else can do that. Which can predict? You me? And so, so but if I can, I it, so if anyone, whoa, whoa, whoa. So anyone who can make a future prediction and it comes true is gets to universal dictate, gets to gets to dictate how people live their lives. So all you need to do, all you need is all you need is a time machine, is what you're saying, so that you know what's going to happen in the future, or, or dare I say it make a stab in the dark about a future event and it ends up happening and you get to tell people what they do with their bodies, who they sleep with and define their their lives in, in every minutia. That's your argument. It's rubbish. So I, and I, I, I muted the caller about 30 seconds ago because he kept talking over you. And oh, good like, grief. there's, there's a whole thing of like how, how conversations work where you, you've got to, you know, listen and okay. speak. Yeah. There's, I'm sorry. there's I'm two sorry. sides to it. Um, so, Go ahead and deal with what Lloyd just said. Okay. First of all, I just said universal implication, and he still hasn't provided us an example. I said it's exclusive. Well, no, I you, I, I thought I no was... you don't get to just throw words at us and we, we, we so that we're some kind of lap dogs and we answer every single – we can just ignore stuff that doesn't make sense. We get to do that. We're not – we're not kind of your puppets. We don't have to dance around to every single word that you arbitrarily decide to throw in. Are, what's your argument for the Bible being the infallible word of God, exclusively the Bible and no other sacred text? What's your argument? You're not giving us a single one, and all you're doing is just throwing words at us and expecting us to, oh, yeah, wow, we hadn't thought about that. Universal implications, seven-day week. It's not how it works. If, if, if you're Are you really, done? Are you done? If you're, no, I'm not done. 
No, I'm not done. If you're really passionate, if you're really passionate about persuading people to share your views, you're going to have to do a great deal better than that. Because this, I've been doing these shows for a while now. This is one of the very worst. This is right up there with I Found God in My Serial, which I think was one of the very first atheist experience ones I did. This is a really bad one. So what's your evidence for the Bible and exclusively the Bible being the infallible word of God? All right. I'm going to try to respond again. And uh, let's see how uh, if you can control yourself. Because I just said it predicted the future and it has universal implications. Therefore, it is exclusive. Can you yeah. give me an example of anywhere else, anybody else who's made a claim that has universal implications? Why? So I, okay, let me let me let me let me dive in here. So. Um, okay, I, and I, I want to try to explain why, why we don't have to, okay? Because it's a silly yeah. question. So, but before I do that, I want to really, really quickly tell you that um, I actually thought about you because I've heard you call into a number of shows doing this um, about a month ago. So about a month ago, I was in Mexico and I was at a place called Chichen Itza, okay? It's a Mayan historical site. There's a temple. OK, and the temple is constructed so that it lines up so that on the equinoxes, this shadow like creates this effect where it looks like there's a snake coming down this giant pyramid. It's really, really super cool. Um, it's a four sided temple. Anybody can look this up. And each side has there's these steps going up. There's 91 steps on each side of the platform with the top being the 365th step because the Mayans had worked out a calendar on essentially what I think you would refer to as a seven day cycle. They did this completely independently of anything having to do with any Hebrew God at all. Uh, they just, you know, looked at the, the seasons and the moon cycles and stuff. And, and they worked out that a seven day cycle works. Okay. Like many, many, many other cultures did. Um, you can see seven day cycles with, you know, Sumerians and pre-biblical times, the seven day cycle, there's nothing about it that is in any way unique to the Bible. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to say it was, it was a funny thing. It was a funny moment that I'm standing there in Mexico. I'm with my wife. I'm trying to enjoy this heritage site. And as they're describing the way they worked out the calendar and the number of steps and everything, I was like, I wonder if the seven day cycle <laughs> has ever heard of Chichen Itza anyway. Um, the Bible can make a claim, okay, about a seven-day cycle, okay, which I'm not sure that it, it necessarily does what you're saying it does. But for the sake of argument, I'll just I'll just say it does, okay? The Bible could make a claim about the future state of the world. It can say the world's going to follow a seven-day cycle, and this is going to happen because of the Hebrew God's authority. And then the world, broadly speaking, could go on to follow what you're describing as a seven-day cycle for reasons that are completely independent of this alleged God. There, there's, there's nothing that you've done to show that there's actually a link between like a cause and an effect here. It's just asserted. A book says a thing and a thing happened and nothing tying those things together. It doesn't matter if anyone else has made such a claim. You haven't done anything to prove that there's any substance to yours. Yeah, and what you're doing is you're ignoring you're ignoring the argument where we say let's let's grant you the benefit of the doubt, even though we disagree that this is a future prediction, even if we grant you that it is a future prediction. On what basis are you seriously suggesting that just being able to see something that's going to happen in the future gives someone the right to dictate how people live their lives and to insist that they worship you? for the rest of eternity. Yeah. What's the basis for doing that? And you completely ignored all that before and just went on with this sneering, uh, oh, universal implications. Ah, please, please say something that, that responds to this particular wording I keep barking on about. That's This is the frustration I have with you. I'm not convinced you're actually interested in what's true or not. I think you're only interested in, frankly, just, just railroading the conversation along how you want it to go. Yeah, because you think you found something clever, but it's it's really, really not. Uh, can I speak now? Please. Or, okay, I'm not muted? No. You guys can hear me? 
Okay, yep. perfect. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna respond to you, Kenneth, first, and then I'll fin- finalize with Lloyd, and I let you guys go. Uh, first of all, uh, the Aztecs, you said, or the the Aztecs, uh, they kept a 355. Mayans. Mayans. Okay, the Mayans. All uh, everyone can verify this. The Mayans did not keep a seven day cycle. They kept a yearly cycle. They didn't have weeks. So already there, you're you're proven wrong. Second of all, the Sumerians kept a lunar cycle, yeah. not a seven day cycle. So it wasn't a recurrent seven day cycle. So certain weeks would finish with eight or nine days for it to be in uh, in, in alignment with the cycle of the moon because the uh, um, uh, lunar cycle is twenty nine point five days. So again, you're wrong about uh, this, uh, uh, the Mayans, and you're wrong about uh, Sumeria. And, how long was how long was the Mayans lunar cycle? How long was it? I didn't say that Mayans uh, had a lunar cycle. I said they had a yearly cycle. It was in uh, alignment with the 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 the, uh, the sun. It had nothing to do with the moon. So that's actually not that's not entirely true. There there were elements of sun uh, and moon, and the menstrual cycles of Mayan women also factored into how they they broke they this have down. A seven day week. They didn't have a seven day week. So you could throw that out of the garbage. Anybody could verify this information. It takes a couple of seconds. And right, the- but they had, they had a 28 day, they had a 28 day cycle, right? It, a lunar cycle is 29.5 days. It doesn't amount to a seven day, uh, it doesn't divide by seven. And I just told you, according to every scholar, they would add eight or nine days in so the last you're, you're being very selective in how you're, in how you're, you're applying this information because the numerous cultures have used 28 day cycles Lunar and they've they not as one. a lunar cycle. One. You are you are wrong. I've just and gone on Wikipedia. I've just gone on Wikipedia and it's telling me that the seven day cycle comes from the Babylonians. I mean it's been it's been all over the it's all over history. There's nothing but 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 you're not you're not direct, in any way engaging with the, the larger point here. No. He went to Wikipedia. I am going to the primary source called the Enuma Elish tablets. The Babylonian tablets, the fifth tablet, uh, from verse ten to thirty-one. He's telling me what, what Wikipedia says. That's none of the, that, none of this, that none of this has this anything is, to do. None of this has anything to do I'm, with I whether you've done anything to substantiate I'm your claim. I'm educated on the topic. It shows you I'm educated on the topic, and you guys are for anything to justify your your madness. Edu- That's what educated. Educated is a, a, a interesting word to use. You've done nothing okay, to demonstrate that your claim is is substantive or true, or, or there's anything behind it. A book says a thing. A thing happened. Is is what you got? So so okay, the, the whole seven day the whole seven day claim being exclusive to the Bible is bogus, and and a very very quick internet search yes. unpacks that whole lie that you're it's trying silly. to peddle <laughs> on the yeah. on Talk Heathen. And again, even if we grant you that the Bible predicted something that would happen in the future, which we don't, but even if we did. How is that a basis yep. for me and Kenneth to spend the rest of our lives worshiping a genocidal maniac that once that once wrote in the Bible that gay people should be executed? Yeah. You, you're, you're not making any any arguments at all that justify your position. No problem. I'm going to get to you, Lloyd, in a second. Am I muted? Or no, you're not, you no, you're not, because you're just a silly troll. Can we move on from this? We sure can. Yeah. We got we got a couple minutes left in the show, and we can a better way to use that time would be to acknowledge our crew. Would be yeah. to do literally anything, <laughs> anything else. else. So, yeah, I, I'm, 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 I'm sort of happy that you got to experience that guy because oh, good grief. he's that's been doing one this of the for worst. a long time. That is yeah. one of, and that's a special kind of delusion, isn't it? Because he, he's really convinced himself of his own BS there, hasn't he? Yeah, there's that's quite scary. <laughs> there's, there's a yeah, this, this idea that um, the greatest enemy. To, to knowledge, the greatest threat to knowledge is the illusion of knowledge. When yeah. people think they've already got something. He, he's convinced himself that he is like some genius <laughs> yeah. that, that hasn't been discovered yet. Yeah. And and talk, calling into talk heathen is his is his fast track to wider acclaim. He, he's going to be the next Jordan Peterson who's going to tell everybody <laughs> about universal well, there was a universal seven day significance. Cycle. Yeah, Make universe. your bed on the seven-day cycle. You see, you see the, the universal implications at right. stake here. <laughs> There's a metaphysical substrate to the cycle. Um, the <laughs> in his own mind, I think he is the next Jordan Peterson. It's really, really tragic, <sighs> isn't it? I don't know. The... <laughs> it, the, the the interesting thing with all this stuff, and and like if if there can be like a, a like a grand takeaway from today's show. Um, 
it, I would just like to tell everyone, just like, like just slow down. Like, yeah, none of us are are as as smart or well informed as we probably think that we are. Um, all of our conclusions should be held tentatively because we we don't know everything. Okay, and I like the more that you come try to like come off the top rope and be like, Hey, listen, I'm going to elbow drop in with this seven day cycle thing. Cause I've got it all figured out. All you're doing is showing your ass because you are, you are, you're, you're demonstrating that you are ignorant about history, about comparative religions and about a whole host of other things, frankly, that we don't have time to get into. Um, you know, who's not ignorant about a whole bunch of things is our crew. <laughs> can we, see, can we see them? How's that for a transition? Can we, can we, can we get that crew cam again so and see, We've got the crew cats. We've got the crew cats. And Wonderful. a crew, another sort of baby up in the, the corner there, a little infant with big, big ears. Um, <laughs> very, very cool. Nothing, no, nothing would be happening without without those guys. Um, no. So we we appreciate our crew very much. Um, listen, I want to just reiterate really quickly that if you want to support the show, uh, you can become a supporter. You can find us on Patreon. You can join the Facebook group. You can listen to us on the uh, the the, uh, the tiny.cc slash AEN podcasts and all that. Um, I hope you join myself uh, so we can we can miss Lloyd in the Discord after the show. Um, and I hope you stick around for nonprofits and AXP today. Um, Lloyd, what do you have going on this week? What's 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 new? I'm frantically. I'm going to be taking a trip to Texas shortly and yeah. I'm, I'm preparing for that getting all well I, i'm already jabbed i just have to prove it yeah uh, and i also have to take a test and all that sort of thing so, i know yeah. a number of people who are very much looking forward to getting to spend some time with you down in texas i i Thank would be you. too i unfortunately will not be in texas because i'm moving um listen uh can we get some love rings going for all of our wonderful viewers um for the listeners you'll just have to imagine the love rings wow. uh, they, they are there um, they do have an effect on you don't they it's yeah like, whoa <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I didn't know they I could like do this, that. Like, yeah, I always want to kind of like Hadouken them like I'm in Street Fighter, but that's, yeah. that's pretty aggressive. Okay. Um, hey, listen, <laughs> whether you're a believer or not, if you're an essential worker, uh, thank you. We very much sincerely, no matter where you are on this planet, we appreciate the work that you do. Um, it's been it's been a wild, you know, couple of years here. Things things are uh, bananas, frankly, and uh we, I don't know what else to say other than that we appreciate everything that you do. Uh, thank you from the bottom of our, of our little atheist hearts over here. Um, if you, uh, if you are a, uh, a non-believer, okay, uh, this is your community. We want to foster that for you. We, we appreciate you as well. Um, connect with us. Uh, I always tell all of our, our, our atheists that are out there, if you're, you know, in some small town somewhere and you feel like you don't know any other atheists, you feel maybe a little bit isolated because you're not part of that religious majority we have here on our planet, uh, connect with us. There are people all over this community who want to want to be your friend. Um, if uh, you you are a believer, I just I just want to finish the show by saying we don't hate you. We're just not convinced. We want the truth, so watch Truth Wanted live Fridays at 7 p.m. Central. Visit tiny.cc slash yttw and call into the show at 512-991-9242 or connect to the show online at tiny.cc slash calltw.